We at the uh, uh, Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv University in, in, uh, uh, with the Fulbright program are delighted to have Professor uh, Jeffrey Kopsten here today with us. Uh, Professor Kopsten is going to talk about anti-Semitism on campus. Uh, just a few words about uh, our guest today. Uh, professor Kopstein is a professor and chair of political science at the University of California uh, at Irvine. In his research, Professor Kopstein focuses on uh, inter-ethnic violence, uh, voting patterns of minority groups, and uh, anti-liberal tendencies in civil society, paying special attention to cases within European and Russian Jewry history, Jewish history. Uh, these interests are central topics in his latest book, Intimate Violence, Anti-Jewish Pogrom Pogroms on the Eve of the Holocaust, uh, out with Cornell University last year. Professor Kopsen, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so I'm told I'm to stand here uh, for the filming. So th thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank the university and all the various programs, the, 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 uh, the center, um, the, the support of the center. Um, and it's wonderful to, uh, there's a couple of people I know here, including one of my former graduate students, Eitan Schiff, uh, who's here is now working for the, at the embassy. Um, so I, I don't get to Israel very often, but it's really it's a delight to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about today some of the research that I've done I, with um, um, Dr. Rachel Shenhoff Goldberg. She's she's actually a PhD from Tel Aviv University um, in social work, uh, and you'll see why in a couple of minutes that it involves uh, expertise that uh, a social worker who works on <laughs> survey research um, does. Um, so uh, the title pretty much describes what's going on. I'd like to start with a small story. I arrived at the University of California at Irvine five years ago. And um, one week after getting there, I got a call from my dean. And I was chair of the Department of Political Science. I still am. And the dean says, tonight, uh, actually tomorrow night, is visiting is Aaron Barak, right, the former uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. Right? And he's going to be visiting, and I said, that's wonderful. And he said, but there's one thing, the dean of the law school is out of town. I said, okay, I'll be there. Right? And he said, well, I'm going to be out of town too, so I'd like you to be the chair of the talk. Um, I said, okay, I can be the chair of a talk. I've been the director of a center for Jewish studies before. I know how to deal with this. So he goes, I, I go to the law school, I chair the talk. But halfway through the talk, I start getting past notes. Right? The police. Right? The police say outside of the room are um, students from uh, Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, and they want to come in. I said, that's fine. Right? They can come in and ask questions. There's nothing that our own Barack that, the, that they could possibly ask him that he couldn't deal with. Um, he was dean of the law school at Hebrew University. I'm sure he's dealt with all kinds of misbehavior. Um, so he, um, they wrote, sent me another note. They said, well, they're really not interested in asking questions. And at that point, I said, okay, let's keep them out for just a little bit. Right? So he, I, I stall, and he gets through his talk. At the very end of the talk, um, they, uh, the police finally give me, pass me more notes, saying, we can't keep them out. Right? This is a free speech issue. So I said, okay. Um, um, they come in. Um, at that point, I made a decision, and I'm not sure it was the right decision. He gets through his talk, and we were have, going to have questions and answers at that point. The audience looked a lot like you, right? That is, older community members plus some students, um, mostly Jewish. And at that point, I made an executive decision. I said, no questions. End of talk. I'm not sure I made the right decision. I perhaps made the wrong. Maybe it would have been kind of harmless. I don't know. But what I was worried about was a repeat of a previous event that we had had on our campus. That was when Ambassador Michael Oren came in 2010 <coughs> um, and tried to give a talk where he was shouted down uh, by the Muslim Students Association. And that was a big uh, fiasco. So at that point, I decided um, I wanted to do a survey of students on campus. The people from the Jewish community and some Jewish students insisted that this was just anti-Semitism. The activists insisted that it was, no, it wasn't anti-Semitism at all, right? That this was um, a territorial dispute. It was about Israel. It wasn't about Jews, per se. So I wanted to find out how true that was, right? So um, I'm going to tell you about the research that I've done. 
So obviously there's a lot of concern about anti-Semitism in the United States right now. We've had some pretty high profile um, um, incidents, uh, tragedies, uh, Charlottesville, the Pittsburgh shooting, um, there's been swastikas painted um, on my own local Orthodox synagogue. Um, it's, it's the security at the Jewish Community Center where I work out every single morning has been picked up. There's been a bomb threat. Actually, one of the, there have been several bomb threats. One of those bomb threats did come from Israel. Um, you've heard about that, I'm sure. Uh, but one of them didn't. So there, there is increased interest, unfortunately, in this issue. Um, there's critical student activ uh, activism regarding Israel on all campuses in the United States, but especially the University of California system, and especially my university, the University of California at Irvine. Jewish students report, right, and I'll talk about this. Uh, we don't have that many Jewish students at University of California, Irvine, but we have some. There's probably five or six hundred. We don't take an ethnic census, out so of, we don't know. Out of? Out of 30,000. Um, so Jewish students do report feeling uncomfortable, um, sometimes feeling threatened. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that too. And so we want to know, is this a political <coughs> conflict over Israeli policy over, or over anti-Semitism? Um, and the other question is, is, to the extent that there is a toxic <coughs> environment on campus, is this being created by the campus environment, by professors? Um, there's a lot of talk out there. So we wanted to try to address this question. So there's been previous research on this. It's almost all been surveys of Jewish students. Right? Um, there were three well-known studies, kind of excellent studies, done um, at uh, uh, Brandeis and one at Stanford. Um, a quarter of respondents of these Jewish students um, from all over the United States, okay. no problem, um, reported some hostility to Israel being a big or a fairly big problem. 15% of this um, report, you know, there's, there's a level of hostility towards Jews. Um, you have to understand 15% would, would not be out of line with the rest of the population in the United States. That's um, reports of anti-Semitism put it at about that level. Of course, among the Jewish students, those who feel the strongest connection to Israel are also the ones who will most likely to, to report this as being a hostile environment. Right? Um, even so, the, the last the, the Kelman and his, and his uh, collaborators at Stanford University report that most students, most Jewish students feel well integrated on campuses. They feel pretty good. There is a, level, a certain level of discomfort on, um, when Israeli politics comes up, and they sometimes feel sidelined. And as, as a matter of fact, that, that word sidelined is the title of their um, talk, of their uh, study. What about non-Jewish students? Well, to the extent, and I can't find anything else out there. I think I'm really the first one to do this. Uh, um, non-Jewish students um, have been surveyed on four campuses, Brandeis, Penn, um, uh, Harvard, and Michigan. Um, you'll notice, of course, Brandeis is a Jewish university, right? So it's what, what it, it may be skewed to begin with. Harvard and Penn are elite universities. Only Michigan is really comparable to the University of California system. Um, and so, and really, it doesn't have a reputation for deep hostility towards Israel, though there have been incidents there, too. Um, some scholars have argued that campuses change attitudes over time regarding ethnicity. They make people more to like democracy, democratic citizenship more. Other scholars claim that universities do nothing. Right? That is, the universities teach people knowledge, but they don't change your fundamental underlying attitudes. There's been research on this question over time. Nothing to do with Israel and Jews, but there has been some research. <coughs> There's been lots of research on, off, on the relationship between attitudes towards Israel and Jews off campuses. And consistently, there's reports of a modest correlation, a modest correlation right, between negative attitudes towards Israel and negative attitudes towards Jews. But there's really been very little done on campuses. And that's where kind of our research comes in. Okay. How much is a modest correlation? But between 25 and 30 percent overlap, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. I, I'll, I'll show you some of the results here. 
So, some hypotheses. So the purpose of the study is to see whether the attitudes are associated, or there's an association of attitudes between um, um, correlation um, between anti-Semitism and attitudes towards Israel. We want to know if there's a campus effect. That is, the longer you stay on campus, will that influence your attitudes, right? Um, that is older, and also another campus effect, this is a hypothesis, is that older cohorts should be more anti-Israel and less anti-Semitic. Um, another hypothesis, this is common out there, that social sciences and humanities produce anti-Israel and anti-Semitic feelings. Right? The sciences, <laughs> the, the natural sciences and the physical sciences, not so much because we're not teaching them about politics in, in the natural sciences. Okay. So we want to know, is there a fundamental difference in how long you've been there and what you study? So, uh, just for purposes here, and I realize this is, this is a bit ridiculous, what we can, I think what we can all agree on is there are attitudes that are negative towards Israel, area A, attitudes that are negative towards Jews, area B. What we argue about, this is a kind of a, this is a Venn diagram, right? What we argue about is how big is area C? Actually, talking about area C in Israel is kind of weird. <laughs> but um, how big is area C? How big is this? Some people insist that it's very big. Some people insist that it's very small. That's what we're trying to measure. Right? That's the purpose of this. Right? So the research design. University of California <laughs> campus. I've talked about, it's a, it's a campus with lots of pro-Palestinian activism. Um, there's been lots of demonstrations. Every year there's a, an apartheid wall that's put a nice sturdy thing that's put up for a week during Israel Apartheid Week. Um, here it is, I took this picture. What's actually really interesting about this is one of my favorite little pictures of my collection. I love this one because what you'll see is that the only occupied territory of Israel is not the occupied territories, according to this. This is supposed to be funny. Okay. But, um, that it's, it's a strange map. It's a strange map in which the, the West Bank is not large enough, um, and but it, 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 it's kind of representative of what goes on on campus for a week. Right? It comes, it goes, um, and it, it's 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 long, and there's lots of lots of propaganda on it, and. Um, this is all to show you that it is that kind of campus. So the survey that I did uh, with, with Rachel uh, Shenhoff Goldberg was to ask students about their attitudes towards Israel and Jews. After some haranguing, and I say this to the camera, after some haranguing, the university gave us 3,000 randomly selected emails. Right? Now that's, anybody who knows, is a political scientist in here knows that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. The university didn't want to do it. Right? Um, because they said, this isn't university business. And we said, well, of course this is university business. This is campus <coughs> climate. It's one of the most important things at the university. Um, then they said, well, there's privacy issues. And I said, but you do this for other things. They said, yes, but finally, in the end, I said, look, you have nothing to be scared of here. Right? This is simply, uh, they, didn't want, they were worried about the results, obviously. I said, this, we're just going to publish sci a few scientific articles. Right. And uh, maybe a piece or two at the Washington Post monkey cage, where I, I publish pretty regularly. But it, it's not an op-ed. These are scientific results. OK. Can you see that? This is, I'm sorry about this one slide. This is the one really bad slide. I, I apologize. This shows you the breakdown of what we got. We, out of 3,000 emails, we got 468 responses. That's pretty good. That's a 15% response in an internet survey. If you, when you hear about what the, how popular BB is, what they're doing is that they're making phone calls and their response rates are 2%. Right? Um, so this is pretty good. To get that good of a rate, we had to have a raffle for iPads and, and Amazon gift cards. And this was just quite normal uh, to, in, in student surveys. What you can see here is something that I want to point out a few things that are particular to our campus. Um, first of all, um, is that um, a huge percentage, 47% of our students are first generation university students. The University of California, Irvine, and all University of Californias are an engine of upward mobility. A huge engine. That means their parents didn't attend university. Um, secondly, look at the ethnicity. We have white, Asian, Hispanic, and other. 
right? And what you see here is that in our sample, only 15% are white, only 19% as a whole on campus. This is our survey. This tells you that our survey is representative. We're pretty close to what the actual percentages of students are on campus. So this is, you know, 40, our, the way it works on campus, so 27% of our students are Latino, 40% 40, 40 are Asian. This is the new America, right? And it's super interesting in that respect, but it is just one campus. Um, Who is uh, other? Other is all, kind, all kinds of different, there all no kinds of different, students, right? Will you, will you there are very few, but there are very few black students on our, on our campus, and it's, a pro, it's a, an issue at the University of California as a whole. It's not just UC Irvine. Because they uh, several years ago, um, affirmative action was made illegal um, uh, in a California referendum. Okay. Um, what you can see here is there's roughly half um, natural sciences and half social sciences and humanities. Um, and politics, the vast majority um, of the, so the um, um, Democrats outnumber Republicans hugely. But it's, Cal it's California, after all, right? There's uh, there's a supermajority of Democrats in the California legislature. It's not that it's not that surprising. Okay. So that's um, you know we have data on religion, we have data on ethnicity, we have data of of which year are you in? Did you complete high school in the United States? You're not allowed to ask them are they foreign, right? So this is our way of dealing with the, so. The vast majority of our sample is domestic, which is, of course, what you'd expect. Um, foreign students are less likely to fill out um, surveys. Okay, so let's push on. Are we clear? Okay. So what are the questions we ask? We ask a series of questions. We ask 14 questions about Jews, trying to tap into four dimensions of anti-Semitism. Right? You'll see in a minute what questions they are. <coughs> And scholars of anti-Semitism usually break it down into four dimensions. There's sometimes more, sometimes less, right? But this is, in the scholarship, this is pretty standard stuff. Hidden notions of hidden Jewish power, dual loyalty, more loyal to Israel than you are to the United States, Holocaust minimization, that is Jews talk too much about the Holocaust, or maybe six million didn't die, that kind of thing. And then traditional negative Jewish traits, such as pushiness, aggressiveness, wanting to be on top, or my favorite question in all of this is Jews use the blood of Christians for ritual purposes, right? You'll be pleased to know that, that very few people say yes to that, right? But even the, the, the very few that do is quite disturbing. That should be an easy question to answer. Okay. Regarding attitudes towards Israel, we asked 10 questions, right? <laughs> Which, like these questions, have been asked for 30 years. This, these questions, the Jewish questions, have been asked since the 1950s, in fact. Uh, <coughs> these questions are more recent, having to do with the treatment of Palestinians, the commitment to peace, the fault for the conflict, US policy, views of violence. I'm going to show you the questions. So here's an example. So a student gets, there are absolutely no, so what you, what you receive is there are absolutely no right or wrong answers. Use the specified scale, one through six. This is called a Likert scale. It's used in public opinion research all the time. We took out the don't knows, because the don't knows which would go in here, and the reason is because there's lots of research showing that racists hide behind the don't knows, yeah. right? Um, so we didn't want to have that there. We made students make a choice. It's ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree, strongly disagree to strongly agree, so here's a typical one. Jews have much too much power in our country today. Right? We want to know. So this should be a fairly easy question to answer, right? If you're not anti-Semitic. Um, so here's the anti-Semitism anti questions. And which shows you, so here are the questions. And you can see them. I'll leave them up for a minute. This over here is the average answer. So the higher the number the more anti-Semitic you are. I, I, I hesitate to use the word anti-Semitic. The more negative views, stereotypically negative views of Jews that you have. Okay, so you can see all of those questions fit into one of the four. And so you can see here this Jewish use of blood has, has the lowest number. But still, you do have some. I, I really wanted to know 
who are the people who are answer, answering that positive, but you're not allowed to contact them, right? So it's the, for, for the you know, ethics reasons. Um, okay. So these are 468 responses. And these are the, this is, so what we did is we created an anti-Semitism <coughs> index of the average score of all of these answers for each student. Each student got a number. <laughs> That's their average score. Okay. Um, now you can see the Israel ones. Ten questions regarding Israel. Um, same thing. And what you can see here, if you look at these numbers, they're systematically higher. Meaning people are more critical of Israel than they are critical of Jews. Right? It's there. I'm going to give you some very clear evidence of that in a minute. Right? So here you have questions ranging from you know, the treatment of Palestinians, the violence in the Gaza Strip, um, the, you know, the responsibility for the use of force, um, justification for terror, um, you know, admiration for Israel, irritation with Israel. So we ask, you ask it, and the good news on all of these questions, these questions are, are highly correlated with each other, which is what public opinion researchers want, right? They, what's called, they load on each other very well. That is to say, they're tapping into the same thing. Right, both the Jewish questions and these. Right? So there's a correlation of about, I can't remember, I think it's like 75% in your answers to these. Right? Very high. Okay. Now, forget about these last two. Right? What I'm going to give you is, here is the mean score for anti-Semitism, 2.5, and here is overall, and the mean score for anti-Israel, 3.6. That shows you that people are more likely to at least say they don't like Israel in some respects than they are to say they don't like Jews. There is definitely anti-Semitism. It's there, right? We want to know. The issue is, what is the relationship between these two things? I'll talk about these later. OK. What is the relationship? Are we clear so far? <clears throat> I'm presenting it. I know this isn't a statistics crowd. I can tell just by looking, but that's okay. We're going to go through it nice and slowly, and I promise nobody will get sweaty palms or, or get nervous. What does the statistics in three inches of water. You, you will, and it's about to get worse. Um, so here is the first, what political scientists call, da-da, moment. Okay, so here's the first moment. What is the correlation between those two sets of attitudes? And what you have here is close to 20% which is in line with other research. It's close to 20% overlap. A significant, but modest correlation. It's statistically significant. Now, what I want to tell you is this low number here, my friends who work on African American politics and Latino politics said, don't be surprised. Right? This is, it's quite common that um, um, this number is very low on research in race and ethnicity people don't like to say that they're racist, right? It's quite common. So we have to figure out ways. We want to, first, we want to determine what are, the, what are the determinants, what are the correlates of anti-Semitism. Is it Israel, right? Is it Israel? So let's take this number and work with it for a minute, right? I'm gonna fix it. You know, I'm gonna give you a fix for it in a couple of minutes, but let's work with this number for a while. Let's just assume that we're going to look at what are the determinants, what are the, what are the things that would allow you to predict whether somebody's an anti-Semite. Right? Okay. Okay, now you're not going to get nervous. I'm going to explain this table to you very slowly and easily. This is a regression. The determinants of anti-Jewish attitudes. Right? And what this shows you, right? Anybody ever take a statistics class in here? Uh, you know regression? Yeah. Okay. So if you know regression, you'll, this, what this tells you is I'm right. right? <laughs> what, how am I right? I'm right in two ways. That number there, that is um, this large. This is the largest, largest of all the variables. What that shows you is anti-Israel sentiments is a very highly predictive sent, um, um, factor in knowing whether somebody's an anti-Semite or not. It's there. It's there. Right? It's definitely there. Now, the overall relationship is weak, but to the extent that, it, that anything can predict it, anti-Israel sentiment is very high. 
What you see here next, I'm just interested, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, I won't talk about it right now. Gender, that is, females are much less likely to be anti-Semitic. Muslims are also um, um, disproportionately anti-Semitic. I'm going to explore that in a couple of minutes. Um, and Republicans are also slightly anti-Semitic. I'm going to come to that in a few minutes, too. Right? Not all Republicans, but some. That's the point. Right? Now, there are challenges to what I've just shown you. Huge. And I called it social desirability bias. That's well known in survey research. People don't like to say views that they know are not going to be popular. So if somebody's an anti-Semite, they're not going to tell you they're anti. You can't ask somebody, are you an anti-Semite? <laughs> right? Well, you can, but only truly anti-Semitic people will say that. I don't think our students, even the ones who, who score high, are, I don't think they're anti-Semites for the most part. I think that they have these views. They're not ideological anti-Semites, but what they have is stereotypical views of Jews. Okay. You could, in fact have very low negative attitudes towards Israel and be an anti-Semite. And we're going to see that actually happens. That actually happens. It, 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 there is a group of that. <coughs> so how do I solve this problem? I don't solve it. You can't solve it. Right? But here's what I do. On a six-point scale, I code anybody as anti-Semitic who has an overall score above a three out of six. Now think about the questions that I asked. That should, I don't think that's unreasonable. If you ask somebody, do you use Christian blood for ritual purposes? What does it mean, for example, to say, I slightly disagree? No? I slightly disagree. Means, well, you know, maybe they maybe they're not. You know, that I, 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 I could reasonably code that person as anti-Semitic, or at least that answer. But I don't. They have to be overall above three. That is, they have to hit many questions or some questions above three in order to be coded as anti-Semitic. I think that's reasonable. <coughs> to be anti-Israel, I use a different scale. That is, you've got to be above 3.5. There is no social desirability bias to saying that Israel does bad stuff. I've been in Israel now a week. There's no social desirability bias here against saying Israel does bad stuff, right? <laughs> Right? Sorry? It depends where you are. It depends where you are. I've been at universities, of course. <laughs> You're correct, completely. Um, so what I want to say that in the United... And we just saw by the answers that there's very little social desirability bias. As a matter of fact, I asked a different set of questions. We, we did. We asked a different <coughs> set of questions about um, saying, all countries commit human rights violations. Here is a list of countries. Rank them from, from, from best to worst. <coughs> You'll be pleased to know that Israel ranks, according to the students, just between um, Nigeria and China, right, on that. So people will definitely say they don't like Israel, right? There's no problem with students saying that. So I think this is a reasonable approximation of being able to classify people um, as either anti-Israel or not anti-Israel, <coughs> critical of Jews, not critical of Jews, which yields you four possibilities. Jeff, how many standard deviation is it about the mean, the 3 and 3.5? Is it far from the mean, or do you Well, you can, we can go back. I mean, you know, um, let's see if I can go back here. Right? There's the standard deviations, right? Maybe the next slide. The one back. Is that the... No, the one down. Yeah, yeah so there you go. Okay, so the Israel is around the mean and the yeah. anti-Semitism. I, I don't think it's a totally unreasonable assumption, right? It's an assumption. I'm also making an assumption here that you can, and it, I'm not saying it's a correct assumption, but I want to remember what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out to what extent these two sets of attitudes correlate. I'm assuming, therefore, that you could be completely um, against the existence of the state of Israel and not be anti-Semitic. It's, an, it's a methodological assumption. It's not... Um, a, a theoretical or philosophical assumption, right? I'm making a methodological assumption. Yes? Okay. Israel attitudes, that's anti-Israel attitudes. Yes, yes. It's a, the higher the number, the more, I mean, I said that, right? The higher the number, the more anti-Israel you are, right? Clearly. 
I have to say, you won't be able to figure out what my politics are in this talk. <laughs> Nobody will, right? That's not, I, don't, I don't give that kind of talk in public. Okay. Let's go on. So, here are the four possibilities. You could be not anti-Semitic or anti-Semitic, or you could be critical of Israel or not critical of Israel, which yields you four different groups within the 468, right? Now, what's interesting for our purposes are these two groups, those who are anti-Semitic. Notice, out of 468, you got 42 people who are Zionists, <laughs> but don't like Jews. They're there. It exists, right? I'm not going to give you a regression analysis of this. What I can tell you is they're disproportionately Christian conservatives, right? And some Republicans, including some Asian Republicans, right, who are in that group. Now, what, what does it mean to say they're anti-Semitic? What it means is they probably learned some things in church, right? Um, um, so that's number one. More interesting is this group, which is the purpose of my talk. This group, the 83, who were coding as both anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Right? So you have 83 out of 468. It's, it's a high number. It's a high number, right? And that means maybe I haven't coded it perfectly, right? You, you know, but it exists. It's there. Who are they? Who's, who's that 83? That's what I want to know. That's the purpose of the talk. So what you do is, let me, what you do is you treat that as the thing that has to be explained. And you say, what factors could possibly stick you in that box? What, uh, what demographic or political or sociological factors that are inherent in a human being could, could be associated with being in that box? That's what I'm going to show you next. First of all, it's a regression, but I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. It's very easy. What this shows you is that there's only one factor in this entire thing that explains being in that box, being Muslim. Right? Now, that's, on the one hand, not that surprising. Right? On the other hand, um, I'm not. I don't think this is a case of campus um, anti-Semitism at all. These are remember these are we interviewed them a month as the freshmen, the, that is first year students, a month after they showed up at the university. <laughs> they, they, they hadn't been exposed to the university yet, right? So we have that data, and I'm going to show it to you. What this is probably this probably reflects the parental home some now. What I'm going to show you is the fault. So the vast majority, what I want to say, is the vast majority of Muslims are not there. Are not there. So in the sample as a whole, that is in the 468, 10% right, are Muslim. Right. This is showing you the anti-Semitic and anti-critical of Israel, 22% are Muslim. Muslims are represented in that 83 at twice the rate that they're represented in the rest of the sample. That tells you something, right? It tells you something. It's there. But remember, the overall relationship is modest, right? It's there. Now, there's a whole lot of other people, right, um, of the 83, of the 83, only 19 are Muslim. To say you have a lot more people who are not Muslim who are in that 83. And that's what we need to figure out. Who are they? Right? Who are they? What they're not, Democrats and Republicans, that's pretty much the same as the sample as a whole. Democrat does not lead you to predict that you dislike Israel or Jews. Republicans, to some extent, predicts Jews, but not Israel. Republicans tend to be very pro-Israel. What else doesn't do it? It doesn't appear that the differences between the natural and the natural and the physical sciences is very large. It's there, right? Um, but it appears to be the opposite of what you'd expect 
that there are more people who are anti-Israel and anti-Semitic in the physical and natural sciences than in the humanities and social sciences as a percentage. Okay. I'm going to push on. I was the Asian. Could you say a word about the Asians? Oh, the Asians. The, the Asians. So look, they're 56 percent here in the of the 83. I'm going to go back. Um, ethnicity, Asian, 45. It's not that different. It's there. It's there. Some of um, they're definitely there. You're not the first person to ever notice that. We don't know what to make of it. I mean, really, what we need to do is we need to go back to these students. It's very hard to go back to them, and I'll tell you why. When I did this, now everybody knows I've done this. <laughs> so I, there was a, a woman who gave a talk uh, a while back at our department. She was a Palestinian. Not our department. It was a different department. But I went to the talk. She was a Palestinian. It was it was a pretty critical. It was a talk that was pretty critical of Israel. But it was a, it was a good talk. So I went af up afterwards and I introduced myself. How are you? Blah blah blah. And Jeff Kopstein, she said, oh, you're the one who's done that survey. And I, was, I said, on one hand, I felt really great that I've, I've known, right? <laughs> on the other hand, I realized that I've contaminated the waters, right? So I, what I haven't told you is we also ask a, an equal number of questions about China and Chinese Americans. Because we try to make it about privileged minorities. Right? We tried to, and also, so students weren't going to, the problem is, is my name on the thing at the top, the students received, this is a survey by Professor Kopstein, I worried that they thought it was going to be Jewish, 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 and so we put in <coughs> stuff about China. We have interesting results there that will be reported in a different article, right, um, in, in some, some of the same things. Do some of the Muslims identify as Asian, maybe? Yes, and it's a problem. It's a, it, it's, that's another issue. So we have, a, we have Indonesians. Right? We have, um, so it, that's why we haven't dug deeper into this. Okay, let me go. Um, Could you say something about the Catholics? The Catholics are not, Catholics are fine. As a matter of fact, the Catholics, we thought the Latinos would be, um, so Catholics are, are actually underrepresented. Um, so at the campus as a whole, there's about, I can't remember at the first slide, it was like 26%, something like that. So they're actually underrepresented in this. So it doesn't really come up as, as significant. Um, okay. Why doesn't the religion add up to the 83 students? We have some missing, we have some missing values. Okay. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I think um, in this as a whole, it's 458. So the problem is that as students go through, they're answering 80 questions. <laughs> and we had some people, this was a, a flaw in our research design. We were, we were debating, you know, how many questions should we ask them and how many questions will they actually go through in order to get an iPad, maybe, right? And we asked too many questions, so we had some dropouts. Um, and people, and it's also, from a methodological point of view, there's this problem of, of what's called straight lining, one, 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 right? It's, it's, a very, it's very common in public opinion research. We don't have a lot of it. But you could do a whole separate article on this, just on the methodology of public opinion research on contentious issues with students. Let me get through my, my, my talk, and then because I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. OK, so what about campus influence? Is this the campus that's doing this? I've already given you some evidence that I think it's probably not, but I have some stronger evidence. And this is the university, when I reported this to the chancellor, he was thrilled. Um, so. I mean, of course, but, um, and it, it, so campus, if, if exposure matters, you should see fundamental differences in attitudes over time. Now, and if major matters, you should find differences among majors and views. Now, I'm going to give you limitations of the data. If you really want to study this correctly, what you should do is we have what's called panel data. You should have a set of students in their first year, and then next year, ask them again, and then the next year, ask them again. That's called panel data, right? We don't have that. We have one snapshot in time, which asked you which year are you in? First, second, third, fourth, and of course it's America, at a university, a public university where lots of students work, fifth, right? So some students take longer than four years. I'll be thrilled if my son's finished in five years. Okay. <laughs> so. Here are attitudes towards Jews and attitudes towards Israel. 
right? It's a six-point scale, remember. I just listed the four here, just so you can see it easily. What does that show you? No difference. Nothing really matters. It doesn't matter, right? Um, I could show you, I could use, report to you ANOVA scores if you're a statistician, uh, but it would show you the same thing, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, there are some small differences in the fifth year, but they're not statistically significant. Um, and that's kind of interesting. Um, what that shows you is that if we liberal professors are propagandizing our students, we're not doing a very good job. <laughs> we're incompetent. Right? Or, alternatively, students are smarter than we think they are. Right? They don't come, they don't, you can't come in, and the students, it's hard to hide your values from your students, right, at some level, right? But um, students actually are capable of thinking for themselves. Um, I think this shows that. It doesn't mean that Jewish students don't feel, who are close to Israel don't feel uncomfortable when they see Israel apartheid week. Undoubtedly. But what that's not associated with is a generalized relationship between um, hostility towards Israel and anti-Semitism. Right? Didn't you say before that you only asked freshmen? No. This is first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and fifth year. Right? I, I said oh, that I among... I, did, I didn't say I only asked freshmen, right? I said we also asked freshmen. These people, we did this in fall 2017. These students had been here. Our, our, our term, because we're on the quarter system, our term starts at the beginning of October. By the end of October, we'd, asked, we'd done the survey. So it's there. I'm not trying, this shows you that anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sent, sentiment exists. It shows you the relationship is modest. <coughs> We also looked at majors, and rather than show you a bunch of squiggly numbers, I will simply tell you, it doesn't matter. And you saw that already from my analysis of the 83, with the anti-anti group, that it didn't matter there either. Um, so I, I was shocked to find this. I'll, I'll be honest. Because I'd always thought, you know, the social sciences were pretty apolitical, but I always thought the humanities, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be like so politicized the classroom. Like some professors don't even believe you shouldn't politicize the classroom, right? Um, and as department chair, I've had to deal with before, you know, somebody, you know, trying to sign up students to work for a politician, and I would always have to write, no, you can't do that, right? Um, so I thought that for, perhaps you'd have this. You don't. Right? Whatever the professors are doing in the humanities and social sciences that the general public views as being kind of a liberal <laughs> factory kind of thing, that's not the truth, at least at our university. At least at our university. Now, you know, you should replicate this study at other universities, but this, this is a pretty good study. Okay. Conclusions. How am I doing on time? You're good. I'm good. Well, lots of time for attack. <laughs> There's a moderate overlap. It's there. I'm not trying to minimize it. Right? It's a moderate overlap, which reflects the general <laughs> sense in the public as a whole. A moderate overlap between anti-Israel and anti-Jewish attitudes. Um, there doesn't appear to be much of a campus effect. And the evidence, what I think that the, the, the role of Muslims, it's not Islam per se. It has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with the communities. The, um, the, the, what the, what Islam, what the, what the role of Muslims suggests in all of this, and the fact that um, um, there's not much difference among the cohorts, suggests that extra-university or pre-university socialization is really what's driving all of this. Now, we don't have super solid evidence for that, but it, our evidence is consistent with that. Um, what we really need to do now, and this is a pilot study, Right? What we need now is to get a grant, right? And to do it at different universities. I mean, the best thing to do would really be to go to a kind of a white university, right? Israel. And do it in Israel. Do it in Britain. And right? you'd be surprised. Not, I used from the university, I moved from the University of Toronto or University of Colorado to do it there with a kind of much different demogra student demographics right. and much different politics. Um, and of course, panel data. Panel data would be the gold standard. That would be get students in their first year and keep on interviewing them. They did this not with Israel. They did this with, with um, blacks, whites, and Latinos at UCLA. Because they wanted, because when UCLA became really multicultural, 
they wanted to see are the students get, get along. So they did a, an amazing, Donald Sears did an amazing study. Uh, they actually had roommates, dorm roommates, over time. Um, this study doesn't do that. This study really just dips, dips your toe into the water and presents, I think, a, a, a set of findings which are both sobering and, and hopeful. <laughs>